Beep boop, intro music. Welcome to Cypher Sci-Fi Explorer on Y. Christopher Peterson. I'm Lee Colbert. Happy New Year. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to do the noise for the thing. This might be New Year's Day, depending on if I can edit it fast enough. Happy New Year. So we watched a movie. Uh, for the first time, venturing into a really large world of stuff that we haven't cared about before. It's been there. Everybody talks about it. It's very British. Who would that be, Chris? <laughs> Colbert, what movie we watched? Doctor Who. That's actually the name of the movie. Yes. And now if you're asking of which 60 or 70 year span, it's the one everyone's seen, the movie from 1996. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> that's where you start. <laughs> I detected some sarcasm. There is a reason for this, though. It is New Year's. Either this might be coming out on New Year's Day, for one, or second, uh, we're close to the new year in any case by the time this is released. So when I went looking for New Year's movies, there's a very short list. Some of them are better than others. And I noticed that Doctor Who was on there. This is Doctor Who, and sometimes it's called Doctor Who the movie, depending on where it was published. I but mean, there was a Y2K movie specifically. Oh, is there? Yes. I missed that. What's it called? Y2K. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I thought, what is slightly better than Y2K the movie? And I found that Doctor Who the movie took place on New Year's Eve 1999. It's going to party like it's 1999. There's some of that. So I, I think, I actually have no idea how much of our audience is Doctor Who type people. Whovians, I, perhaps. But we're going to do some Decipher Sci-Fi in this, where it doesn't actually matter what we're covering. We got some stuff to talk about. Spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the movie. Colbert, what's Doctor Who about? Doctor Who is what it's about. It That's true. The master is killed. But not really, it turns out. He does some kind of sabotage and wind up on Earth. And the master is trying to steal the doctor's body and winds up opening an eye, which is going to destroy everything. And I guess shenanigans occur. I'm assuming the master is a thing that is present in lots of the who stuff. Like he's a bad guy. He's, he's a like a arch nemesis. Arch nemesis. I think. So, okay. So people, even if they haven't An seen- evil time lord or something like that. So doctor who's a time lord. This other guy's a time lord as well, but he's bad. And now uh, he is loose on earth trying to steal doctor who's life force something, something. Colbert, what do you know about Doctor Who outside of the things we just said? Because we just read it after we saw the movie. Not very much. I've seen a couple. I'm most familiar with Tom Baker, I think, before this. And then very little exposure outside of that. Just because I had a cousin who was super into Doctor Who. Ah, so Tom Baker, it appears from internet, is one of the old Doctor Whos. Oh, he's the fourth Doctor because I looked this up, I think. Okay. and now Not I think I looked it up, but I think... Because I looked it up previously. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of my extensive Doctor I Who I looked knowledge. it up, therefore, I think. Or some such. Said a wise man. And this, uh, and now the the Lady Doctor now is, it seems like that's pretty good. People seem happy about it more or less. And that's the 12th Doctor. This movie is the one single appearance of the 8th Doctor. There's a whole like regenerative uh, like story excuse for the guy to keep coming back. There's the one appearance of the 8th Doctor. I looked it up online because I was wondering about this. And it was like, if I'm going to do this movie for Decipher Sci-Fi, because there's whole seasons of TV shows, right? And multiple seasons for some of these people. And I don't have that kind of bandwidth or interest in Doctor Who. So I think the idea here is like we can cover a self-contained single Doctor Who movie that has the one Doctor Who in it. And we will see how that goes. It'll be our entree into the entire thing. Because tell you what, I haven't seen any of the Doctor Who ever under any circumstance. I've watched the internet become interested in it since the David Tennant or no, since uh, the Moffat fellow took over the whole thing some years ago. But this is before that. I was saying, I looked it up online. I wasn't sure what we're getting into. It seems that this is a pretty well-liked doctor as far as doctors go. Paul McGann? Sure. I liked his manner. He was cool and goofy. He reminded me of James McAvoy. Maybe it was James McAvoy. Maybe James McAvoy is a vampire. Anyway. New Year's, 1999. Colbert now, when I I found this and insisted that we do Doctor Who, I didn't realize this was not just New Year's Eve, which is what I was going for, for theme, but it was New Year's Eve 1999, which is the specialist of New Year's, because it's the beginning of the new millennium. Except it's not. Pedantry. I was giving you yes. that. I knew that I knew you would do this. Pedant Colbert, what do you mean? Usually I get to be the jerk. Just a small point that you know, typically we don't have year zero. 
that we count by. So it would be the ending of, it would be the last year of the current millennium, with the next millennium starting on year one. Yeah, that's that's a tricky issue. It actually doesn't matter. Like it does it's all arbitrary all. garbage anyway. And yeah, if you bring <laughs> that up in actual conversation with other people, like face to face, they just give you a stink eye. You're you're outing yourself as a certain kind of person if you're going to. I know who Chris note. is, and I know he appreciated it. So that's <laughs> yes. Why I said it. Hey, you're you're in good company with this. It's worth making this. What's the cyber side by here for? Right? It's like it's worth making the pedantic point. Just because now we all know a little more about something. <laughs> it's not that you have to fight about it. <laughs> so for the next one, you'll be all set. <laughs> Which we might be here for. You never know if some of this life extension technology comes through. Cross your fingers. The reason it was actually more notable, it wasn't that it was the turn of the millennium. Like, who cares? What does that even make a difference with? It's the number changeover issue. It's going from 99 to 100. Or actually, well, go no, from 99 back around to zero. And that would be easy enough if we did everything on paper. But... This was an issue for computers, sort of. Legit, it was legit. It was legitimately a problem. Uh, it's just, it's really, I thought it was kind of strange that in 1996, this movie came out, and they're like, it's New Year's Eve 1999, new millennium, yay. And computers and atomic clocks, and there's technology here, and no one mentions Y2K. And actually, this wasn't, this movie was in 96? Yeah. So this is before all the hubbaloo about. That's what I realized. Where trains would be falling out of the sky. Trains? <laughs> yes. Everything just wouldn't work and Skynet would come alive. Gravity turns upside down somehow. Yeah. The computers don't work. Uh, yeah. Uh, 1996 is about the time that it appears when I look it up that like it started to ramp into media sort of – like the time it's real that we're looking for is the moment that it becomes like a ratings grab for news and stuff. And that was just starting to happen maybe sort of kind of around the time the movie It was when out. it started costing people money because they had to fix it. It was – we can't push this off anymore. We need to pay people. I guess those are the two ways to look at it. I was looking at it in media taking advantage of people's fears. But that, you- yes. But also only because managers and executives were getting bills and line items to fix this thing. Yeah. No, you're, you're totally – that's probably more – that's the better answer, I think. Y2K – Y2K referring to the year 2000, 2K, is a numeronym. And he was giddy and he rubbed his hands together. I was like, oh, I got a new word. I'm going to talk about this all the time now. A numeronym is a word with numbers in it. They may be entirely num- numerical, or it may be uh, partially mixed in numbers, like maybe lead speak counts, that whole thing. This isn't something I want to belabor, but numeronym, pretty neat. And there were alternate names for Y2K before it kind of settled in. This is a problem that definitely came up 30 or 40 years in computing before before the 99 to 0 changeover. But no one really cared that much because money, right? And... The way it was being talked about, there were alternate names, Century Date Change, CDC. That's kind of taken already. There was also FADL, which doesn't really roll off the tongue, faulty date logic. So somehow, eventually, we wound up with Y2K. It's effective. It sounds apocalyptic. Maybe that's why it took off. It does kind of sound dramatic, doesn't it? Our audience will mostly remember the hullabaloo about this, right? You would think? Well, yeah. So the hype was that everything would come grinding to a halt. All databases Trains wouldn't work anymore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that level of exaggeration. <laughs> so the thing, you got to go back, like way back, way up there into IBM punch card history. And think of like, uh, what did we cover the movie? We covered the movie Hidden Figures, which I think might be the only time punch card computing has come up on the show somehow. But computing stayed there for a little while where data, ex- you put stuff in on a punch card and that's it. And at that point, in earliest computing history, you are very short on space to put stuff. Are you going to spend more space on your your scant 80 columns on your punch card to make a four-digit date? Or are you just going to know, like, the computer system can just add 19. This isn't going to be a problem for another 50 years. Who cares? And you can start storing dates in a two-digit format. It makes sense in that context. It even makes sense in the immediate next context where hard drive storage and memory are still, they will remain, like, inhibitively expensive for decades, basically, into the 80s. Except what the real problem was is that it costs money to refactor your programs. Well, exactly. For these things. Yeah, yeah. Well, think about it. You start with the punch cards. You you have you have developed algorithms and software and business practices around a thing that is established. And not to mention that some, langui- some languages were actually uh, inhibitively made this way. What do you mean? Like COBOL, for instance. The way it's stored to dates is it would wind up subtracting like 1900 in some versions to get the actual date. 
you kind of want to blame the people who started the whole thing with for for messing this up, but so it was a lack of foresight in the languages, and oh, then Lord. in the actual programming to account for date date formats to give them a little room. You know, it's kind of fair that we're very short on memory in a lot of cases, so you got to pack as much information as and, and that, that's a reasonable way to do it. Except for you just ruined like a lot of everybody's time come 1999. Because that's when everybody did it. was like the last year. But, I mean, not my problem for 30 years. No, exactly. And then what wound up happening is a lot of people got called back and got paid a lot of money to fix these things. Who actually knew all these old languages. Yep. It still persists. It, it's, it's like a, there's still a different form of this problem up ahead. It's looming. And we don't talk about it now because it's not next year. But the, the way Unix systems keep time is, is second since the epoch. Which for some reason starts on January first, nineteen seventy. I have no idea why that actually is. Do you know? I did. I feel like I read it once and then yeah, forgot. Uh, yes, yeah, the same thing. <laughs> Whatever it is, it's probably important for like the first Unix system or something. Who knows? But there still is a Y two Y two K thirty eight looming ahead now, where in thirty two bit systems using thirty two bit integers to store the date, they're going to run out of seconds. So this is a hard problem. Like we're. we're Critically, like, oh, this thing they thought of 40 years ago. It's too bad they didn't think ahead too more. They think ahead more. I mean, the Unis thing worked out better than some particular utilities and systems did with the Y2K deal, but it still is the same problem again. Just shifted. This is important to Doctor Who. Totally. Uh, the whole date- <laughs> Well, it is because he travels through time. He does. And having concrete knowledge of when this is is important. And how you how you account for your time travel code. Is, you know, it's yeah. probably important. Who wrote that code to the TARDIS and how does it work? Like, which date time libraries are they using? As much as we're going to run into representing dates again as an issue, we already have. It's like, it's really difficult to imagine a time travel scenario where you're trying to say, I want to travel to like Monday, November 5th, 500 BC or whatever. And the further back you go and the different places you go, it's actually like super difficult to calculate this sort of thing because of differing time standards and different calendars over time in different places and there are even like municipalities that decide politically like we don't take place in time zones or whatever so all the calculations go off for this one sliver of the earth that doesn't affect everybody else even mundane time zone calculations are a horrible pain in the ass the whole the whole thing at the most mundane level is terrible and then trying to go back in time and calculate like we even lose years and months and days on the calendar if you go far enough back where the algorithm sort of to go back to times and represent a specific time in history is not like a simple calculation, but rather a like it's processed through a giant list of different exceptions and rules and weirdo things that happen and still might not really be right. Like you really don't want to be the guy maintaining daytime libraries for a programming language anymore, ever. Unless that's your ability. Unless that's your <laughs> <Calendar calculation. laughs> call back to Predator, which may or may not have actually been published yet. Calendar calculation comes in handy. <laughs> but that's a good that's a really good point for the Doctor Who. Because on his control panel, he's like 1999, December 30th, and the Humanian era, which I guess is like what we would call the Anthropocene now. And that's it. That's all the specificity that we see represented in the interface for his time travel. And I know it's Doctor Who, so it doesn't matter, but that is is not that hard to maybe point back to that particular date. But I know he goes back in history, history. At which point, there's a lot of difficulties in navigating the calendar space. It's all dealt with the back end. It actually does the the, the age of the planet, because that's important to know where it is in the universe. And then there's a conversion that happens and tells you, I want it in modern day human translation. Like you were saying, there are different epochs. On Unix, we live in Lynx land, and it's, we have days since the Unix epoch, which is January 1st, 1970. But what if it was like the universe epoch? Like, how large a value, we could do the math on this, how large a value, and would that ever be reasonable in computing systems, to hold seconds since the Big Bang, for instance? Well, why would seconds be fine enough for you? You want to, because well, I'm running out of computer memory, Colbert, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already having trouble. The age of the universe is around 436 petaseconds, says uh, a thing on the internet real quick. There might be a reason we don't we don't use that value. But that's because we're not time traveling and we're not going across space and time that way. That's going to be a thing. I, I mean, if we're it's traveling around the universe and we're time traveling, then you need something to represent those values. That's all. 
at that point, you can open an interdimensional, interdimensional like memory rift and just store data in there, right? If your TARDIS can be the size of a warehouse inside, why not? I don't know if we should go down the rabbit hole of how the TARDIS actually works. No, Colbert, I agree. We don't want to do that. Perhaps instead, talk about atomic clocks. Perhaps instead, we can talk about Doctor Who himself. Because uh, I don't know if this is much of an issue in the rest of the world of Doctor Who, but it introduced to me and you the idea that Doctor Who has two hearts. Like that's the whole thing that gets him killed in the beginning and then regenerated. Two hearts, which is itself very interesting, but also to have it in a human is the thing that really takes some consideration. Because we have some animals with more than one, sort of with more than one heart. This includes octopuses. Octopus has three, sort of, kind of. It's always sort of, kind of. We, we have a shared history with all these other heart-bearing creatures. So it would be weird if they were just totally different structures there. You mean almost anything on the land? And I mean on the surface of the land? Typically has a somewhat common ancestor, so has one heart. And it winds up anything with multiple hearts is either in the ocean or under the ground. And as like the furthest environment from our own, basically it comes down to stuff in the water though. And it's uh, with the squid is three and a hackfish has four. And the problem is that they're still not all really hearts so much. It's like they have a heart and then they have the, the secondary and tertiary extra pump just to like really get things going at that one extremity type situation or secondary tertiary and quaternary in the case of the, <laughs> the case what of the, about the nerval uh, nerve bundles and octopus then that's pretty much like they have multiple they have secondary tertiary quaternary cent- centenary i'm trying to think of the words for the, yeah the the octopus is just crazy the thing about oh octopods are from space haha it's like maybe because they have t- they have three hearts and like a bunch of sort of brains they're nuts and hackfish is just gross those are the slimy ones the general theme here, though, is main heart pump stuff, and then these extra ones are there to get it going to the spot, you know, like add a little oomph to the system at the extremities. That's all. Although, if depending on how loose your definition is, there is some symmetry that you can draw. If that is just pure functionality, like your calves help pump blood back up to your heart when you're moving. There's an increase in pressure to return blood. Hmm. It's the skeletal muscle pump. It's a collection of skeletal muscles that aid the heart in the circulation of blood. And it's mostly for uh, returning blood to the heart. So you probably have like really great circulation because <laughs> your ha- your calves are the size of my thigh. Colbert is known far and wide for his calf monstrousness. Thank you. It's so hard to build mass. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, if you get them larger, you can get more blood moving through you. Maybe like... Uh, Extra pressure and like squirt blood out of your eye as a defense against predators. <laughs> it must be bad whenever he's cut. The thing with the, the two arts that he has, we see them on it like a, a an x-ray and they are basically right next to each other, which doesn't make a lot of sense in the way that we see the extra hearts, so to speak, that are in other animals tend to be out in different spots because there's a pressure pickup that's needed. Unless you're going with the like Klingon redundancy. They have like multiple organ redundancies. Oh, that was an fighting. evolution through battle where they get stabbed yes. into one kidney and they're like, aha. I I've got like three more. <laughs> <laughs> they keep going. Come on, sucker. There is the one case where this sort of actually happens. It's really rare because it seems like a real pain in the ass and dangerous. But there are some 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 heart transplants that they will actually be done so that the, the transplanted heart is grafted onto the tissues of the existing heart instead of replacing it. But then having two hearts is, how does that work in the entire system? He's an alien. He's got two hearts. Back to the TARDIS, Colbert. <laughs> Hear me out. The TARDIS uh, seems to run on its its main engine sort of whatever thing is the eye. However that works, who knows? Doesn't make a lot of sense. Its time settings seem to go out of sync. It's damaged. They can't time travel. They can't fix the problem that they're presented with by time traveling. And so their solution, this is like the main thing they're doing, is they have to find an atomic clock, so they can use that to like resynchronize the TARDIS and solve lots of problems. Atomic clock. I take issues with that, though. With what? Why does he need to synchronize to Earth agreed upon time? There's no, like, we don't have a galactic standard that we're following. We don't have the unsigned billion-bit integer that's counting seconds since the universe epoch, right? We just have a very accurate clock, and we're saying 
counting from now, this is good for like billion years to be accurate. I think this could kind of make sense a little because there's a couple considerations where atomic clock, we take that as like atomic clocks are the best clocks, right? They're perfect. But atomic clocks, even within atomic clocks, there has been a range of performance for how accurate they have been. For time travel, it's important, probably. How about that? The thing, like, look at how we have reduced the error bars on our time measurement over time. That's an awkward way to put it. But you know what I mean? Like, think about where clocks have come from and the things that have been afforded to us. Sure. It was the sun is here in the sky. That's a pretty good start. And I looked at it <laughs> versus the sun is here and I'm looking at a shadow. <laughs> Just Sun's better. not here. It's nighttime now. <laughs> and I have no clue what time it is. So I think what you're getting, the first kind of measurement device is just look at the sun. Or a sundial is a pretty good improvement if you can do the things around that to make that actually functional. The error bars are very large, though, on that one. You can get an hourglass. Again, not super precise, but pretty good. But that all that, that's like the best we've got for time measurement. Granted, nobody was really clamoring for a better clock, necessarily, until the uh, 17th century when Huygens, of Huygens probe fame, invented the uh, pendulum clock, which we don't give it a lot of credit now, but for what it's worth was a huge step forward in accuracy of time measurement. So in that case, here's the, here's the, here's the breakdown, more or less. Huygens pendulum clock lose 15 seconds a day. Pretty impressive. Now imagine the scientific measurements and tests that you're able to do that you weren't able to do before in the 17th century because you now have more accurate time measurement. Think of how important measurement accuracy in all areas is for actually making different progress in different areas of tech. Super important. So that's great. 15 seconds a day. Big step. The next thing after that, basically, is in 1929, the invention of the piezoelectric like quartz watch. Like if you get a cheap watch, that's the thing it's using. There's a quartz crystal and there's electricity and it'll vibrate like a tuning fork. And that'll get you... And that in when it was invented in 1929 would get you a second off every four months, which is another huge improvement. And then just look at how we leap with the atomic clock to the earliest being 0.01 milliseconds off per day. Because now we're at like 0.01 nanoseconds and better as time goes. We're talking about now like large chunks of the history of the universe before we're off by a second. And all that, like you might be like, cool, we can measure time better. But it's from zero to time travel. Like what in between there? Like who cares about this stuff? And you do because how often do you use GPS and how ingrained is that into society? into our technology and everything we do. And not only that, the internet. Who would have thought that having an agreed upon time for these series of highly interconnected machines would wind up to be important in their communications? <laughs> yeah, you think? And it's not like you, the user, care about this, but all the systems that underlie all the things that you actually do online on a computer are relying upon time synchronicity to function within some frame. I think GPS is the real thing, though. Like that straight up does not function at all in the way that we want it to work. Well, it could. I mean, what? there's probably a there's large loss in accuracy. It would be the, that you wouldn't the, want. Yeah. Well, the the loss in accuracy is like hundreds of miles. So you know which side of the earth you're on. <laughs> That's pretty good. And don't 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 doubt for a second that humans are clever and we come up with an alternative technology if we didn't have the time accuracy to make up for it. But the way GPS works is those things have an atomic clock on them. They tell you what time they think it is. And your device, whatever that is, calculates from those, based on the accuracy of that timing, where you are on the planet. And so, yeah, it, we're talking, if those didn't have atomic clocks in them, we'd be looking at hundreds of miles loss of accuracy in GPS, basically useless for the way we use it. The thing about the GPS, you've said this before in different contexts, has been relevant on the show, that... We're actually talking about speeds and distances where relativity is a thing. Yes. We need accuracy at that point for it to work. <laughs> like me calculating how to throw a ball to you across like dozens of feet is so small scale. But we're talking about speeds and distances. These are satellites around the planet in geosynchronous orbit. We know they're not. So we're talking about a bunch of satellites, a whole huge network in medium Earth orbit going around the planet that's big enough and fast enough. Relativity and atomic clocks. Not just like it's not a cause of like there's this there's this intertwining of technological development and requirement of more not just time but like measurement accuracy where you tend not to think about it too much because it underlies the stuff you use but it isn't apparent and don't forget how you rely on GPS for like all the stuff 
I rely on it just to get anywhere, but also the world relies upon it in a pretty big way. For basic commerce, essentially. Mm -hmm. All the things that it has afforded us. If it was even just that one, it's not just that one, but if it was even just that one, can you imagine? Well, it's as the world has gotten smaller through technology, the ability to have a standard time has become that much more important and the accuracy of said time. Yeah. And for what it's worth, this isn't, this is a tidbit. Uh, there are alternative. The Russians have one. Did you realize that? They have their own whole separate network. Of time? Time. No, they have their own whole GPS equivalent thing, which uses not exactly the same standards, but is more or less the same idea. And I forget what it stands sure, for. Because they don't want us being like, hey, no, no GPS for you. You know, it makes perfect sense. You see why that happens. We have satellites up there using older atomic clock technology. It's still getting better and our accuracy is improving. This is enough for GPS, which is great. But there still is room to be, I mean, apparently we need even fewer nanoseconds of drift over the course of the universe. Is that the end of the movie? We can talk about the love story. It was really deep and interesting. It's the end. Hey, Colbert, what did we learn from our first Doctor Who experience? If you want to kill <laughs> a Time Lord, shoot him with a bullet and then give him some anesthetic. Oh, yeah. It's actually not that complicated. What do we learn about Doctor Who, though? This is our first, maybe sort of your first, but definitely my first foray into this world of weird thing. Are you going to go watch Doctor Who now? Probably not. No, probably not. <laughs> to be fair, this is Doctor Who from before everyone became really interested in Doctor Who again. This isn't the Moffat Who. So maybe we didn't get a taste of what it really is now. I blame Chris. I just want to talk about New Year's. It was all right. I don't know. And hey, you know what? Everybody listening who actually knows about the Doctor Who stuff could send us a message. You could go perfectly talk. not hate mail. <laughs> whatever. Add to Cypher Sci-Fi at whatever thing you like best and tell us. Or maybe a good introductory point, like watch this episode. This is this is what it's all about. Yeah, and tell us like how we made the wrong choice and what the right choice would have been. I don't know. It was fine. I got some Doctor Who in my life. Now I now I've had some Doctor Who experience. We'll see where this goes. Recommended related stuff. We didn't mention anything, but related to a couple of things we did talk about. I have a couple of videos that I really like. You may have seen there is a computer file video about daytime and why it's pain. Like we started to mention, but more in depth. And another thing. Cole, remember the engineer guy? I sure do. I know you know him. And we've enjoyed, in particular, his videos on the aluminum can or on the Titanic and her sister ships, in particular. Great, great videos. But back in his catalog, he has some older ones that are pretty good. He has one on quartz clocks, well, mundane quartz clocks, because atomic clocks can have quartz, and then atomic clocks and how they work. It was really good. I like that guy. This is old. So it doesn't have as much of his modern polish, but solid, solid stuff from that dude. The whole channel. Definitely subscribe to that. And then when you're done considering those things, consider supporting your creators online. Whoever's making the thing you're really into, consider helping them out and helping them make more stuff like us. Because look, we we took the Doctor Who bullet for you people. We're earning this. Here are the people supporting this show so we can cover TV movies from the 90s. And Terrence Lee, Joe Ferraro, Daniel the App Launder, Jeremy the Top Poster, Adrian Mahela, Dinosaur Hunter, Alan Michael Pools, Gallifrey and Superman, Robert the Roaster, Adam Piper. Adam Steak in the Mouth Piper. Steak? <laughs> steak in the Mouth, yeah. <laughs> snake in the Mouth. Yes, he was a puddle, and then he transformed into a ghost snake. Oh, well, that'll do. And we got a new person on, Hugh Fisher. Dr. Hugh Fisher? No. Go on. Dr. Hugh. You get it? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it took so long. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Dr. Hugh, for our Dr. Who episode. And Dean at LSG Media, Andy P. Bash 25 Comics, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Andrew Capitula the Mighty, Jeff Freiman Schwartman, Hard Probe of the Nipple Chris Kennard, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Sammy Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Josh FNG of LSG Media, Mr. Ray Gun Curly Phil, Tema Sikkim His Arms Wide, John Wares, I think it's pronounced Huygens, and Milky English Tea Drinker Matt Creek, our Kobe FF Joe Ruppel, and our friend Jesse Privet of the Countdown to Geektown podcast, Lego Doctor Who, Donnie Migliori, Buggy Dude Luke Bailey, Naked Doctor in the Morgue, Lad Avron, a Lark Durkin Gunarm Superhero, Daniel James Barker of Uncertainty Principle, the podcast, Andrew Falcone of this podcast sometimes, John, Champion of Time Lord Beavers. I'm sure they would use their powers for good. Just Beavers Beaverin. I feel like it might be wasted on the Beavers, but there you have it anyway. And DJ Duster and Sunglasses at Night Moffat. That's how you can tell he's the bad guy. And my mom and Grandma Judy, a magical love craze top of her field cardiologist, Unicorn Julian Creighton. Because that's how love stories work in TV movies. Especially with aliens. And like all those people, if they're if we're the thing you want to support, the cybersci.com, so support the show. Support the show. 
Please. Thank you. And if our coverage of Doctor Who did not offend you, feel free to tell others about us. Send them to decipherscifi.com slash subscribe. We're not trying to dismiss all the things people care about sometimes, but like people care too much about some stuff sometimes. (laughs) I don't know what to tell you. You know, there are times where we don't maybe give some things the respect they deserve as far as people really caring about something. But for what it's worth, we're not taking the piss out of it. It's just like it is an equally irrelevant backdrop for us to have an excuse to talk about atomic clocks or whatever. Welcome to Cyber Sci-Fi. That's the end of the show. Just when I found the man in my dreams, it turns out he's an alien. They call me Doctor Who. No, they don't. Good morning. How are you? I'm Doctor Who. It would be like, oh, I just did these few dozen ducks and uh, one for you, one for me, except they're all for me. I'm going to eat all the hearts. Yum, yum, yum. Munch.